Okay, well, we got the Israelites out of Egypt. God's showing his great power. The Lord told Pharaoh that he was the one who had raised him up and put him into that position. Probably quite a blow to Pharaoh's ego because he thought it was all about him and he was God on earth. But that the Lord was in charge, that he was sovereign over these things. All the plagues and things that the Lord brought on them because of their stubbornness were the plagues that, that, that Pharaoh, being supposedly God on earth, and the other gods that they worshipped, he brought them to their knees or showed himself to be more powerful than them. He was more powerful than Pharaoh. He was more powerful than their gods. He was more powerful than the government that they had set up the most powerful nation in the world, and there was, there was nothing that they could do no matter how they hardened their hearts against God. And even God himself hardened Pharaoh's hearts towards, the, towards him. They had no power over God and God doing what he set out to do. And what he set out to do was to glorify himself in all the earth because it wasn't just the Egyptians that knew what were going on. As we go on through here, as they went through the Red Sea, we talked about that and the, the, the amount of people that there must have been leaving somewhere in the neighborhood of, of two to three million. And that as they came to the Red Sea, they started whining a little bit because now we're going to, you know, what's going to happen now? The Lord protected them as he showed up in that pillar of, of smoke during the day and fire at night and made a wall around them to protect them. We were talking today with someone after lunch about the hedge of protection that the Lord's put around us. You know, oftentimes we pray, Lord, put a hedge of protection around us. But He has. It's already been done. It's already there. And the, the, the Israelites saw that. The sea was opened and they went across as on dry land. Not soggy, mushy stuff. I don't know if you've ever been in, in a place where there's been a lot of water and suddenly it goes away. You know, it's, you can get stuck in that pretty easy, you know, depending on what it's made out of. But three million Israelites, plus a mixed multitude of whoever they were, went across there as on dry land. And in order for them to get across in one night, it took a, a gap in the Red Sea three miles wide. So they could go through their 5,000 abreast, is one person's est estimation, it's actually a few of them. Um, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? It'll make you go, wow. The water's heaped up as walls around them and stuff. Little fish swimming by. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? It'd be kind of weird. But yeah, they got to get on the other side and everything. And, and the Lord's there. He confuses the armies of, of Egypt. This army was, they had, they had all the best things of the day. You know, talk about their chariots, the choice chariots. Man, that would be like, I don't know what we got now. It's been a while since I've been in the military. But whatever that is now, you know, they were, the, they were it. They were the superpower. They had all the technology and all the good stuff, kind of like we do now. And yet they were nothing when they came up against the Lord because he just... You know, confused them, their wheels fell off and all that, and then the water just came back down on top of them. They left Egypt in financial ruin because all of their crops and everything were, were wiped out. They left them heartbroken because every household had lost the firstborn. They left them without their labor pool, the Egyptians and all that, their slaves and whatnot. Their army was decimated. And the children of Israel saw the Lord do all of this. And so did those around the world at the time in, the, in that area, in that known world. And word spread. We look in chapter 15. I'm not going to read all of that part of the Song of Moses there. You can look at it. It praises the Lord for who He is and, and what He's done and everything and delivering them. But I would drop down to verse 14. It says, The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia, and the chiefs of Eden will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them, and the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them, 
by the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as stone till your people pass, pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. The word of what happened here goes out to all the people. And Moses, in this um, prophetic statement here, in this, they're going to hear about it and it's gonna, they're, they're going to tremble. It had more of an effect than just on Egypt. The Lord said, I brought you up for this, Pharaoh, so that I could show my might to everyone, to all of mankind, to all the world. We will read later on, after they do their 40-year little tour in the desert, when they come into Jericho, when the spies talk to, to Rahab, she says, everybody's afraid because they know you're coming. Their hearts are melted in them. There's three million people of, of Israelites. The, the size of the people and the amount of people coming was, was one thing because they outnumbered most of the places around them. But the people knew that their God was God Almighty. Because he took down Egypt. Shook them up just a little bit. They sing this song after they come out. Miriam, uh, Moses' sister, the prophetess, it says in verse 20, the sister of, of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. And the horses, and it, the horse and its rider, he has thrown into the sea. Now I wonder if the guys did one stands and the girls echoed. I don't know. <laughs> but they're rejoicing, they're celebrating. They're they're on the other side of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army's wiped out, and they're just praising and rejoicing and everything. It's always easy to do that when you see the Lord doing stuff, stuff like this. When you have those great praise reports, when that stuff's there. Man, the, the, the first song that pops into your mind is praise the Lord and all this stuff. You know, it's real easy to do that. But life isn't always that way, is it? We're going to find out that this doesn't last very long. We look at this, and, and as we go through these next few chapters, you're going to start thinking, man, these Israelites are pretty fickle, aren't they? Well, some things just don't change. How easy it is to turn from that rejoicing and glorifying the Lord to whining and complaining. Verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now, they, now when they came to Marah, they could... Not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of the place was called Mara. Mara means bitter. Um, verse 24, And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Three days' journey. Three days after seeing the Lord bring them out of Egypt. Three days uh, after going through the Red Sea on dry land and watching the armies get drowned and all that stuff. Three days later, you're getting a little bit thirsty. We ain't got no water. They're crying out. They're whining to Moses. You brought us out here. Why'd you bring us out here to die of thirst? And the Lord shows him that there, there's this branch, this piece of a tree to throw it into the water so they're, they, they're not bitter. It says, test them and see. To show if they will. The Lord says, if you, in verse 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, he will not put any diseases on him, which he did in Egypt, for he is the Lord who heals you. There's a little something there that comes back to us, isn't there? That part about diligence. 
the Christian walk and everything, everything that we need for life and godliness, as Peter tells us, is given to us in the knowledge of the Lord and who He is as a result of our relationship with Him. He has equipped us in every way for everything that we need to do this. He doesn't give us a commandment and say, let's see how you figure this one out, without giving us the, 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 the ability to follow through with that. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. You know, as we went through all those gifts and everything, what are they for? Those are the tools that equip us to do the work of the ministry so we can live a Christian life. Without those, without the Holy Spirit, we can't. So he's given it to us. He says, if you'll be diligent in doing this, that means we have to make a decision, don't we? Diligent means to set your mind to something and purposely go after it. You know, as we talked a little bit this morning, that pursuing righteousness. You have to make up your mind that you're going to follow the Lord, that you're going to heed His Word, that you're going to apply it in your life. Diligently. The problem comes in with us about be, being diligent sometimes, doesn't it? We can pretty much almost all the time sort of follow the Lord closely. Can't we? That's not hard, especially when it's good and everything's right and nice and we like it. We like the direction that he's going. But when we come to that place where sometimes there's bitter water, what do we do? We do the same thing they did, don't we? Start complaining. They came and they complained to Moses. And Moses interceded in prayer. And the Lord heard that prayer and showed him how to deal with it. Verse 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water, and seventy palm trees, so they encamped there by the waters. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the, all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. You ever know that Sin is a wilderness? Yeah. Wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the, to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that, they may te that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for, the, for he hears your complaints against the, the Lord. But what are we that you should complain against us? Hold on right there. They go out. They've been gone for a month or a couple of months now out of Egypt. They're getting hungry. They're not getting the food that they're used to. And they're starting to complain. Well, it would have been better for us to just go ahead and die by the hand of the Lord in Egypt than to come out here and starve to death. They're complaining. And they're complaining against Moses and Aaron. And again, there's intercession. The Lord says, hey, I'm going to take care of this. I'll bring, bring you this stuff. We're going to find out that's manna for them to eat. He's going to take care of them. He's going to provide. Talk about the Lord and where the Lord guides, He provides. He led them out of there, and He brings them to this place to remind them that the Lord is there. He says, I'm going to provide this bread for them to remind them that I'm the Lord. I'm the one that brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't Moses and Aaron, and it's not Moses and Aaron's fault that they're there. When things get going wrong for us and everything, one of the first things that people do is... is Complain about whoever's in leadership. Well, wait a minute. Are you following the Lord or not? 
Hey, we do what we do as a church, and hopefully we all together as a congregation follow the Lord and everything. But we all have our individual responsibility. Did you come out to the wilderness of sin? Was it your idea? Was it the individuals? Or did the Lord lead you? You know, every one of them had the opportunity to not put the blood on their doorpost. To not follow the Lord. To not go. They saw that the Lord was working, that, that the Lord was using Moses and Aaron to lead them to pass them on. They saw the cloud because it's still there. They saw the pillar by night. Everything. And yet, Moses and Aaron, why would you bring us out here? Well, they're right there, so you take it out on them. Moses says to him, well, who are we that you should complain against us? You see this situation, they're complaining about Moses and Aaron when they could see that that pillar of cloud went before them to lead them. There's God leading you. What are you complaining to me for? <laughs> you know? It wasn't them. The Lord is the one that's doing this. Moses and Aaron, just like them, are following him. Verse 7, And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you, that you complain against us? Also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. When Moses spoke to Aaron, or then Moses spoke to Aaron, say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, <clears throat> before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. But it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. <laughs> there he is. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning... The dew lay on, on the ground all around the camp. That's a lot of quail, you know it. It's a lot of quail. That's something. One, one estimation was that the, uh, the, the camp that where they, the, they, they would have needed a campground of about 750 mi square miles. 300, or 3 million people, that's a pretty good sized place, you know. You're looking at the valley, you know. That, and that, all them quail, that's a lot of feathers. Always makes me laugh. And then they would have the bread to eat too. Um, verse 14, And when the layer of dew lifted, I didn't go to that part, did I? Verse 13, So it was that quail came up in the evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay on the, all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given to you, you to eat. <clears throat> this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One homer for each person, according to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some more, some less. So when they measured it by homers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. <laughs> and Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it 
every morning, every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. The lesson here in this manna was to trust in God's provision, wasn't it? Sometimes we have difficulty in that. We know that God's leading us. We know that God's going to provide for us. He's not going to let us go hungry and all that. But even when you have this clear direction, hey, this man is going to show up in the morning. By the way, man, it means what is it? Because they didn't know. This stuff's going to show up in the morning. It's going to be there. There's going to be enough. Go out and get enough for your needs. There will be enough. If you need six omers out, there will be six. If you need two, you get, you'll get two. But don't try to hoard it. Don't try to take more. We see when the Lord does things for us, when He provides, when He gives us good stuff and He cares for us, we kind of want some more, don't we? And we, we, we get hold of that and we're going to take some more. And sometimes we know that the Lord's provided for us today, but if there's an opportunity to grab a little extra, because you just never know what the Lord's going to do tomorrow, right? You know, yeah, I'm in it today, maybe today, but well, I'm not too sure about tomorrow, so I'm going to take a little extra. And every time that we get into that place where, where we're second-guessing the Lord and His ability to provide for us, then that extra that we try to get, hedging the bet, so to speak, just in case the Lord doesn't remember the next day, <laughs> and whatever those things are, it does the same thing as this manna. It grows worms and stinks. You know, but the Lord makes sure that we have enough. There's been been times in, in our lives, and in, in April and I throughout our marriage, where there's been abundance and there's been nothing. Yeah, you know, I've, I've probably shared with you the the story of when we went to Yarnell to plant a church up there. By the time we got to town to Yarnell, we didn't have anything left. Bank account was done and everything. And all right, Lord, here we are. You know, what's up? There was a small group of people that were ready to start a church. And when we said, okay, let's do this, let's go, half of them left. And so, well, you know, we're going to stay over here where we kind of been and all that. And, all right. And so we, we, we met for a little while and we found this little place in the, in the corner of this old shop. where It had been set up for a little store. It had two little rooms in there and a bathroom. And I went and... Uh, talked to the guy that owned the place told him what we were doing oh by the way when we the house that we bought when we got there the people that owned it were believers and they they we we, we really lowballed them like crazy on the price got them to carry the loan for us and when they asked us what we were what we were going to do for for work and everything when we got there we said we don't know but we're here to start a church and they went okay sounds good let us help that was the Lord, because anybody in their right mind in this world <laughs> wouldn't have done that. That was the Lord moving. The guy that owned the, the place that we were looking to rent for our, our little church to start in, he had this building, and I went and talked to him and everything and see how much he wanted for it, and he told me what the price was, and I don't remember all the numbers, but I told him, I said, well, you know what, I don't really think that we can go that much. I said, here's what we got. And he goes, well, you know, and he agreed to come down on his price. And he says, all right. So he says, I'll go ahead and, you know, after he talked to his wife, they agreed to rent us the place. He says, we'll go ahead and draw up a lease and everything. We'll have the first and last month's rent and all that stuff like that. I said, well, we got enough for one month. What do you say? <laughs> you know, he says, you don't have that. And. You're not going to sign a, a year's lease or anything? I said, no. He says, well, what's your plan? I said, well, the plan here is that we've got enough for one month's rent and everything. We'll rent the place for the month. And if at the end of this month we have enough for the next month's rent, then we'll do it all over again. He went, ah, I'll get back to you. And he did. And he said yes. And so this Mormon guy rented us this little place with nothing, wow. you know. And, and the Lord was there. It was following him, and he provided, you know. And, of course, I didn't have anyone to complain about because, you know, who am I going to complain to? I said, oh, God, oh, God, <laughs> help us out here, you know. We didn't, you didn't always, you, you don't always wait until you've got 
enough or till you've got extra stored up and all that stuff like that. You, you go forward and you move and you trust the Lord and His provision. And you know that He's going to be the same tomorrow as He was today. And that you can trust in that and that you can count on Him. And the children of Israel here are going to have to learn that, aren't they? They've seen what He can do, but they're not sure that He will continue to do for them. We see the great mighty things when the, when the Red Sea split, but sometimes it's the day-to-day -day things, like a bowl of cereal in the morning, that we have problems with where we begin to not trust or we look to ourselves to provide for ourselves and trust in ourselves and not Him. And then when we run into hard times, into bad situations, when we're in the wilderness and everything, we go, well, Lord, there's nothing here to eat. Maybe we should go back to where it was that we were comfortable. Because we like comfortable places, don't we? It's hard to step out and to do that and to trust. Verse 21, when they gathered up what they had, the sun came up and it melted away. It was gone. And so it was, verse 22... On the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to keep until the morning." So they laid, up, they laid it up till morning, and Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, on, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day, and the house of Israel called, this, called its name manna, and it was like white coriander seed, and, tasted of, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread which... I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before the Lord to keep it for your, your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, <clears throat> as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, laid it up before the testimony to keep it. And the children of Israel ate manna forty years until they came to an inhabited land, they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now, an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. The Lord made them a provision. And he says, you know what? On the seventh day, take that seventh day, the day during creation when the Lord rested. Take that day, sit it apart, relax, and rest. Don't worry about it. You'll have enough manna. Everything will be taken care of. The Lord, care of. The Lord will provide it for you. There were those that still didn't trust the Lord because on, on the seventh day when that rolled around, they got up to morning, hey man, there's no manna out here. They didn't take the extra. They didn't listen. People know the Lord. They know the word of the Lord. And they, they know who He is. But sometimes it's difficult that for us, for people, to really apply the word of the Lord. To really believe it. Oftentimes there's things, and, and sometimes we catch ourselves in that situation where, where somebody tells us, somebody says, well, the Bible says this, and you go, yeah, I know, but. You know, those people that got up on the seventh day, opened the tent looking for manna, 
The neighbor said, well, they told you not that to get twice as much yesterday because the day was a day of rest and all that. I know, but you know, I just figured it would be here. And it's those little things and those little ways that sometimes don't really seem so necessarily important that we fall short and we miss what the Lord's got for us. We get in there and sometimes we don't trust the Lord and we try to take more because we're not sure if He's going to remember to make the manna tomorrow. Or sometimes we think, well, yeah, yeah, it'll be there. Don't worry about it. I know He said take twice as much, but I don't really feel like it. I'll just get some tomorrow. And don't listen. Yeah, I want fresh manna. Yeah. And, and don't listen and don't do that. And sometimes they, they seem like small things, but we miss out. The manna on the sixth day, the double amount, was so that they could rest and just relax and enjoy the Lord. Sometimes we get so busy doing and working and everything and, and trying to figure this out that we forget to just stop and trust the Lord. Sometimes Christians and everything can get so involved in ministry and different things that they forget to stop and enjoy the Lord. You know, I see people, and, and some people need to live their lives a little more organized than other people do, and some's got checklists and stuff they write a bunch of stuff down with and everything like that, and that's fine if that's what you do. And others just like, I ain't writing nothing down, I'm just going. You know, and all that. But, but you, you know the Lord, you trust the Lord and everything. But you get into that place where you, you make your Christian life so regimented sometimes that you forget to stop and rest and trust in the Lord. One of the things that we do is, is, is prayer. Most everybody has in one form or another some kind of a prayer list. Oh, I did my prayer list. Oh, it's time to sit down with my prayer. You got it there. You put it there. It's usually at the same time and you do all this. You go through the routine. And sometimes you pray and you, and, you, and you pray through your list and you do that. But how often do you stop and listen to the Lord? Because our prayer life is communicating with the Lord, isn't it? It's not much communication if only one of you are talking. You know, we've all been in those situations where we're having a conversation with somebody that has to dominate the conversation. And you go on for a long time and don't get an opportunity to speak. That's not much of a conversation, is it? Where you got some, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. Do we do that to the Lord? Are we so concerned in what we're doing and going and serving and whatnot that we don't take the time to sit and enjoy? Remember Mary and Martha? The one of them, oh, we got to get up and serve. We got to go do this, run and do that, stack this over here, put these over here, do the dishes, wash, you know. And all that, come on, she's not helping. Lord, make her get up and help. The Lord said, you know what, she's doing the good thing, man. Hanging out with the Lord. And the Lord builds this into these, this place with these people, these children of Israel who have been taken out of Egypt, freed from that bondage, brought into a wilderness, a place where they're not comfortable and they're not sure what's going to happen, following the Lord who they see, but they don't know well yet. And He's bringing them to this place where they can't do anything other than trust him and saying don't worry about it sit down and relax and just enjoy being in the presence of the lord and trusting him remember to take that time and just sit and enjoy the lord and don't worry about it because he's provided every step of the way there's always enough, just like the manna, however much they needed, there was enough. There wasn't too much. It didn't spoil if you took what you needed. It didn't spoil if you took what the Lord provided. It was there. And when you took the extra for that time, then you could stop and sit and enjoy the Lord. He brings us to that place where, where, where we rest in Him. The whole idea of the Sabbath is to come and enjoy the Lord. Now for us as Christians in all this, it doesn't have to be that, that one day set aside. We do choose Sunday and that's our first fruits, our first day and everything. And that's devoted and dedicated to the Lord and a time to enjoy. But as we go, stop and take the time to just say, hang out with Jesus. And just adore Him. Just enjoy Him. Just think about who He is. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your mind off of the things of the world and put your thoughts on Christ. 
and say, Jesus, just show me who you are. Just let me hang out with him. Those times where, where, you, where you just sort of, you got somebody that you love, that you care about, and they're there with you. I think about the kids, man. I, I love the little kids, my little grandson and our daughters and whatnot like that. They'd be running around and doing stuff and just going crazy. And then there they'd get towards the end of the day or get tired and everything and just come and jump up on their lap and just... They weren't doing anything. They weren't saying anything. It wasn't a conversation. It was just that time of just hanging out together. And that's what he's telling these Israelites, man. You're out in the wilderness and all that stuff. Don't worry about it. I got it covered. Just take this time and relax and enjoy. And sometimes we forget to do that, don't we? Get so caught up in everything that's going on, even the work of the ministry, that we forget to just stop and crawl up in the Lord's lap and just hang out. And then those are those sweet times of fellowship with Him. Yeah, He wants to hear us, hear our prayers. He wants to, you know, us to do the work of the ministry and everything like that. But He wants that time to just sit quietly and enjoy one another. Take the time to do that. That's what He's telling the Israelites here, man. Just take the time to enjoy the Lord. That's what the Sabbath is about. Let's wrap it up right there for tonight.